Last week, we took a look at Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 to 14, and we discovered that God was disappointed with Israel, with the Israelites and their approach to worship. Basically, those people were just going through the motions. They had allowed themselves to slowly drift away from the Lord by failing to focus on His holiness, His greatness. The worship of the Israelites was mundane, meaningless, routine. They settled for offering to God inadequate animal sacrifices. They were willing to present, they were content to pre, uh, pre, uh, present animals that were lame, that were blind, that were defective in some fashion. There was no sense of awe when it came to worshiping God and viewing God. We said it was the priests who led the way, and subsequently their followers also did not revere the Lord or look on Him with highest esteem. God brought an indictment before them. He charged them with shallow or superficial worship. He informed them at that time that He had enough of their mockery. The Israelites, like many today, wanted God to graciously bless them, even though they had been unfaithful. I've been studying in the book of Ezekiel, and in that Old Testament book, the term rebellious house was used 14 times to apply to Israel. They were a rebellious people, persistent in turning their backs on God. We could say that today about our nation as a whole in America. We have collectively turned our back on God. We have essentially thumbed our nose at Almighty God. And I said last week that I'm fully convinced that there's a day of judgment coming upon our nation if we don't repent of our sin and turn to the Lord. So that means that you and I who name the name of Jesus Christ should seek to be pure. We should be sold out, 100% committed to Jesus. And then we should pray for our nation, that our nation as a whole would be broken and that we would turn to God from our sin. There's a great pattern to pray. If you turn to Daniel 9 sometime and go home and read Daniel's prayer for his people. There's a great book by Billy Graham's daughter, Anne Graham Lotz, called The Daniel Prayer. If you've never read it, I have two copies of it, and I'd love to give you one to read. We are living today in a post-Christian America. In Malachi chapter 3, Verse 5, God informs His people through His servant, through His pro prophet Malachi. He says this, Your foolish shenanigans are over. And He lists some of their foolish deeds. Then in verse 6, God says, Because I do not change in my nature, your descendants, you who are descendants of Jacob, that's the only reason that you haven't been wiped out. That's the only reason that you still remain, that you haven't been obliterated. God is saying, listen, you and I both know that you have sinned. And if we're going to be totally honest, we're also mindful that you deserve judgment. But God says, I'm going to extend my mercy solely because of the promise that I made to your father Jacob. And when he refers to the Israelites as descendants of Jacob, that's a departure from the way that normally God addressed the Israelites. It's not how he usually spoke of them. In place, of, instead of calling them Israelites, he calls them Jacobites. Now in Genesis 32, 28, when God gave Jacob his promise, God changed Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel. Before the wrestling with a man sent from God, who in all likelihood was the angel of the Lord, a Christophany, an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, before that wrestling, Jacob was called Jacob because his name literally means a cheat or a conniver, a deceiver, a supplanter. And God changed his name to Israel. Most of the time, when God refers to His people as the children of Jacob, 
it is a direct rebuke for their disobedience. And the important fact is this. Even though the people of Israel had been unfaithful to God, He remained faithful to them. Just as He had been faithful to their forefather, Jacob. Their persistent rebellion had led them far from God. But restoration was still possible if they sincerely desired change and if they really wanted victory. So what about you this morning? Maybe there are some here that if you'd be totally honest, you would have to admit that you have strayed from a close walk with God. There was that time in your life when you had a passion for the Lord, when you were on fire for the Lord. And you're thinking this morning, I've turned my back on the Lord and I've not recently been walking in obedience to Him. And it didn't happen overnight. It was a slow, subtle slide. The recipe for a healthy, vibrant relationship with the Lord is always this. A humbling confession and acknowledgement of sin and returning to your faith in Jesus Christ. And God hears the cry of the repentant sinner calling upon his name and seeking his grace and his mercy. Following along on your bulletin, you see in verses 7 to 10 of Malachi that God brings an indictment against Israel for withholding their tithes and their offerings. And in these verses, God offers a roadmap to reconciliation. God says, a reconciliation, I'm offering it to you. It's possible... But the people must respond by ceasing their selfish, rebellious behavior. God says, you've strayed from me. You have not kept my commands. And if you will humble yourself and return to me, I will return to you. An interesting fact is this. The word how is used six times in the four chapters of Malachi. In the Old Testament book of Judges, the people of God in their typically brazen manner made a habit of questioning God. The same thing's happening in Malachi. The people are asking, how are we to return to you? Now, they weren't asking how they could correct correct things. What they were doing here is they were disputing God's claim. Their position was this. How can we return to you when we haven't strayed from you. Why, Lord, why is it that you think we have a problem? Lord, would you mind telling us what we've done wrong? They were blind to their own sin, their disobedience, their rebellion. And that word return could also be translated repent. It's a military term talking about an about face. It is that you're walking one way and you do a 180 degree turn. Biblical repentance is the restoration of a relationship. It's a reconfirmation of a commitment with someone else. In Malachi 3, the Israelites are invited to renew their relationship with God. Here's the fact. When you are unaware or you are oblivious to how you've ended up where you are, It's rather difficult to get back to where you started. If you don't know that you're lost, it's hard to get back to where you started. If you're walking through the woods and you don't mark your step, your path, it's difficult to retrace those steps. And almost every year we hear, we read of hunters getting lost in the woods. They didn't mark their path and they couldn't find their way back. How much more difficult is this when you don't even realize in the first place that you're lost? That's how it was with the Israelites. They stood before God and they said, how can we return? My God, we're not even lost. Jesus in Luke 19.10 said, He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And before you scoff at the Israelites for their failure to understand their spiritual plight, you need to understand how, it easy, how easy it is to fall into that same trap. Here's the fact. Before you can be saved, you need to know that you're lost. 
That you're dead in your sin and your trespasses. That's what Paul said to the believers in Ephesus, Ephesians 2, 1. You have the quickened or made alive who were dead in sin and trespasses. Romans 3 says there's none righteous, there's not even one. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. And then later in Romans it says the wages of our sin is death. Spiritual death. My dad, and I've shared this before, as a young man, he was a Sunday school superintendent in his church. And a new pastor came, and while he was talking with my dad, he said, Ray, how long have you been saved? My dad sincerely answered, saved, I was never lost. And as the pastor shared the plan of salvation, my dad came to sense, to recognize, realize his lostness and a need of a Savior. And he put his faith in Jesus Christ. But it was only after he realized that he was lost. So today, every one of us here is either lost or we're saved. And we're only saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, today would be the perfect day to put your faith in Him for your salvation. Maybe the vast majority of you have put your faith in Jesus for salvation. And you began a walk with Him. But you know in your heart that you've gotten off the path of obedience. And you sit there and you exclaim, Far from God? Not me. Look, I'm here every week. How can you possibly think I'm far from the Lord? God may be saying the same thing to you that He said to the Israelites in Malachi 3. You may not think you've strayed from me, but the fact is you are far from me. And that requires a deep personal humility and a consistent evaluation to determine your spiritual status before the Lord. And fortunately, to help us in this, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit who has taken up residency in our lives, the moment of salvation. He is available to search our hearts and to show us our real condition. So are you willing to say, Spirit of God, I know you live in me, and I'm giving you freedom to search my heart and to show me if I've gotten off the path. To show me if my walk has grown cool. God explained to his servant Malachi that they were suffering because they had withheld the tenth, the tithes, and other contributions. Earlier in Malachi 1, God questioned the Israelites for their woeful sacrifices, for their lack of genuine worship, for their idolatry, and their faithlessness. Now, in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, God gets even more specific. He cuts to the chase. He pinpoints the heart of the problem. And it is expressed through the misappropriation of funds. And get this. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The core of the problem is a heart problem. The issue wasn't at all what the people possessed. It's what they did with what they possessed, or simply put, it's what possessed them. And these people were guilty of holding back the proper tithes which belonged to the Lord. And God says to them, you have an abundance. Why do you have an abundance? Because I'm the one who blessed you. And nevertheless, even though I blessed you, you're holding out on me. The fact is, you're not giving me your best. Instead, you are willing, you are content, you're satisfied to give me your leftovers. Look at Malachi 1.8. There God tells them, I insist on receiving your best. And what he says is this. Hey, people, you're not giving me prime rib. You're giving me diseased meat. The Israelites lack of financial generosity was not the root problem. It was an indication of something below the surface. The root problem was a wicked heart. Again, look at Malachi chapter 1, verse 13. God says, you're willing to bring me lame, 
Stolen, sick animals. Meanwhile, you have perfectly healthy animals in your possession. And he asked them, do you people really think that I should be satisfied accepting a half-hearted gift? You tell yourselves, well, it's okay, Lord, because I've invested a lot in my livestock. In the first half of Malachi, God addresses the quality of their offerings. In the second half of Malachi, he speaks to the quantity of their offerings. In both halves, the quality and the quantity reveal that their hearts are not right before God. And if you and I would want to minimize the importance of money, then the fact is we're misunderstanding God. There can be no denying, disputing that this passage in Malachi 3, it's all about money. And God is showing you that you can always determine the pulse of a believer by examining his or her pocketbook or their wallet or their bank statement. We may not like to talk about money, but money talks a lot about us. And both for Israel and for us, our wallets betray us. The word tenth in verses 8 and 10 means 10%. All that God was requiring of his people was the least that was required under the law. Ultimately, the Jews know this, and the Old Testament gave above 10%. They were also expected, on top of the 10%, to give toward the feasts or the festivals, as well as for the sacrifices in the temple. If you add everything up, listen, the Israelites gave 23% of their income. Some people will tell us, well, you know what? The tithe isn't really for today because we no longer live under the law, but we live in the day and the age of grace. So aren't we free from the tithe? And to, to that teaching, that philosophy, I say this. Keep this in mind. The principle of tithing predates the law. The law was given in Exodus. Tithing was practiced in Genesis chapter 14, verse 20, when Abraham came back from a battle and he had spoils or rewards that he gathered. And the priest of the Lord, Melchizedek, came and Abram gave him a tenth of what he had garnered. If you study the scriptures closely, you'll always realize this. Grace insists on more than the law. Grace never expects less. And if we're not required to give a tenth based on Old Testament law, since we are not under the law, should we give less than the Old Testament saints did? We're under grace. In fact, if anything, we should give more. 10% can be used as a guide. And we should seek to demonstrate our worship to the Lord through our giving. The second question is, when do we give? We should give out of the abundance that God has graciously blessed us with. But let's be honest. There are a lot of believers who rarely feel like giving. Left to our own inclination, few would give as we should. And I want to make it perfectly clear to you. We should not give out of obligation, but out of sheer delight. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, Paul said, The Lord loves a what kind of giver? Cheerful giver. A delirious giver. One who delights in giving. One who gets a kick out of giving. Gets a thrill out of giving. That is abnormal. God keep in mind, gave us his very best when he gave his son to die in our place on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves me. He didn't give leftovers. He gave his absolute best. And that's why Paul said in that same chapter, 2 Corinthians 9, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. It is beyond description. The gift of Jesus and salvation. 
So there are two principles that are related to giving. One, God has given us everything that we have. James 1.17 says, Every good gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights. Every good gift comes from God. So that led Paul to ask the question he did in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that you did not receive? Whatever you have, God gave it to you. And we should then look at everything we have as not our own resources, things that we've accumulated on our own, but we should view them as resources that God has entrusted to us. That means this. We are trustees, stewards, or managers of what God has graciously allowed us to have. And it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, it's required that a steward, a trustee, a manager be found faithful. That includes being faithful in our giving. Here's the fact. Someday, you and I will give an account of what God has entrusted to us. So what has He entrusted to us? Our time. Our possessions our talents, our finances. And we are wise to regularly reflect on how we would fare at that heavenly audit. How are you going to fare when God says, okay, it's time to give an account of the time you've had. I gave you this many years. This many, how did you use it? I gave you this many possessions. How did you use them? I gave you these abilities, these talents. How did you use them? I gave you these monies. How did you invest them? What are you going to hear God say that day? I keep on saying my prayer for you is that you will hear God say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy, the reward of your labor. Here's your assignment. Go home and read Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, the parable of the talents. And see the ones who invested wisely and see the one who wasted his talents and see how the king felt about each one. Second principle. God's given us everything that we have. Second, the New Testament speaks of proportional giving. Teaches proportional giving. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. On the first day of the week, set aside as God has prospered you. Give as God has blessed you. The greater the blessing the greater the giving can and should be. And I've said this before. Here's what proportional giving is. If you say a tithe is 10% and you make $10,000 and you give $1,000 as a tithe, you have $9,000 to live on. If you make $100,000 and you give 10%, that's $10,000, you have $90,000 to live on. So that means maybe you can give more because God has prospered you. He has blessed you so that you can give more. And it's to be done on the first day of the week. That just means this. Put it in your giving. Put your giving in your budget. And here's the problem for some of us. We don't have budgets. There are people, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm, I, I insist that budgeting should be taught and finances should be taught in high schools. Because young people don't know how to budget. They're like, I'm just spending money. What my credit cards do, now I got all this money on there. There's a day you got to pay. And put it in your budget. If you have a budget, then you know you put in your budget your car payment. And you put in your budget your house payment or your rent. And you put in your car, in your budget, other payments or food and how much you're going to spend on food or insurance, retirement. You put all those things in your budget, put the Lord's, what you want to, what you pray about into that and say, That's the Lord's. And make it a priority. And listen, I don't know what anyone makes. I don't know what anybody gives. And I don't want to know what anyone gives. I don't want to treat anybody any different. Because this person gives a lot and this person doesn't. It is a hard issue. And I say this. I don't know how people give. And when they give. And I'm glad. But if you're one who says, well, I wasn't in church, so I'm not giving, let me ask you. If you say, I was away on vacation when my car payment was due, I'm not paying it. I was away when my mortgage was due, and I'm just skipping that this month. So that tells me that if we have it in our budget, and we say, well, I wasn't in church, I wasn't able to be there, we don't just skip it. But, we get, but listen, 
You don't do it out of obligation. Oh, Pastor Dave beat us down. Listen, there are a lot of pastors that won't talk about it because then someone goes, that's all our pastor talks about. If you've been to this church, very seldom do I talk about finances, but I'm not going to back away from it because it is a privilege to give. It's a blessing to give. It's more of a blessing to give than to receive. That's what Jesus said. We're to give prayerfully, not pull our wallet out and go, oh, this stinks. All right. All right, there's the bucket. Maybe this week I'll just pretend I put something in there. We're to give cheerfully, delighting in it, saying, you know what? The money I give goes to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. We're all stewards of the Lord's money. We should be careful about how we give. We can be all placed into one of two categories. Luke 18 and 19 describes two men diametrically opposed to one another in character. We have, first of all, the respected rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 23. He was respected. He had been given much. He was rich, but he gave little. And he comes to Jesus and he said, I'm missing something. I'm rich, I'm young, and I'm powerful, but something's missing in my life. What is it? What do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. Well, I kept them all since I was a young man. Oh, really? Well, then go sell all that you have and give the money to the poor and come follow me. And he says he went away sad because he had many riches. And Jesus was demonstrating, you really haven't kept all the commandments. The first commandment is no other gods before me, and money is your God. He was trying to serve two masters at the same time. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. He will love the one and hate the other. This man lived what he thought was an exemplary lifestyle. But what he did, he showed an allegiance not to the Lord, but to money. The second man is the despised tax collector named Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. 8 to 10. He's the guy that was short of stature, got up in the tree, the sycamore tree, to get a glimpse of Jesus as he's passing through the crowds in Jericho. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, you need to come down. You and I need to have a a meeting. And remember this. Jesus calls us by name. He calls you as an individual into a relationship with him. And you must accept that invitation. Zacchaeus got down, invited Jesus to his house, met Jesus, listened to Jesus' teaching, was saved, was a new man. How do we know that? Because he said, everybody that I've ripped off as a tax collector, I'm going to pay back. Money was no longer his priority. This guy, at one time, Zacchaeus had a poor reputation among the general population. But as he sat under Jesus' teaching, he became convicted of his greed and his thirst for riches, and he was a changed man. What a great comparison of two sinners. One man, Zacchaeus, repents. The other man, the rich young ruler, retreats. One man, Zacchaeus, is saved. The other man remains separated. Something similar is taking place here in Malachi. The prophet is not necessarily calling out those who have been faithfully giving. He's singling out those who essentially have given nothing. He's calling out those individuals who have elected to give haphazardly, without any prayerful thought, haven't prayed about what they're giving. He's calling out those who are giving without worshiping God. And I have news for you. If you haven't figured this out, God doesn't need your money. But what God wants is this, your heart. He wants you to understand that a closed heart and a closed hand is unable to receive any blessing. And conversely, with a generous heart and hand, you are opening yourself up to receive God's blessings. With a rebellious heart, you are greatly hindering your ability to receive God's blessings. And these blessings certainly may not be monetary in nature. You say, well, what blessings do you have in mind then? His blessings may be giving you His perfect peace, giving you unspeakable joy. 
And those things are priceless. To have peace in your heart. To have joy no matter what circumstances are there. And you see in your outline, verses 10 and 11, God challenges Israel to test his immeasurable generosity. This is the only time in Scripture where God actually permits one to test him in the area of finances. God offers an amazing promise to his people that will be fulfilled if they obey his command. God anticipates his people, like many say, that I can't afford to give. So God says to them, go ahead and put me to the test. Try me. They thought, we can't afford to give. God corrects them saying, no, you can't afford not to give. Put me to the test. Obey me, and I will open the floodgates of heaven the floodgates of blessing upon you. Now God is committing to excessively pouring out His blessings upon their faithfulness and giving. Reading on in verse 11, we learn that He promises not only to provide for them, but to protect them. Now whether that's a protection of a literal form of an army of insects, or maybe an army of invading neighboring people, the point remains God will protect His people if they obey Him. And finally, in verse 12, God will bless those who dare to obey Him. He will grant His obedient people a good reputation as He promised a good reputation for Abraham in Genesis 12. Others will see that God has blessed His people and that God is committed to taking care of His people. And if the Israelites are willing to esteem God as their chief priority... God promises to make them into a great nation. If they choose to exalt the name of the Lord, He is fully committed to lifting them up so that others can't help but take notice. And He says, I will make your land prosperous. No disease, no need, no wickedness. There will be plenty to eat and drink. And He promises to restore their land and their people, to give them a golden age, but only if and when they will obey. So what do we learn from the actions or the inactions of Israel and God's promises in Malachi 3? One, blessing follows obedience. And I want to make it clear, that doesn't necessarily mean immediate reward or that we will automatically receive our reward here on earth. But rest assured, keep in mind what Paul wrote to the believers in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Don't be weary in serving the Lord. Because we know as Christians that our labor is not in vain. If it doesn't happen here, you will be rewarded for all eternity. And second, we are not defined by what we, by what we have or what we think we have earned. What is important is what we do with the resources that God has entrusted to us. And none of us are going to stand before God someday and say, if I had only more money to spend on myself, I wish I'd have spent more money on myself. The one who's consumed with God's glory on that final day will say, if I had only invested more in God's kingdom, in God's business, I wish I'd have given more. Financial activity, just like all other actions, reveals whether we are kingdom bound or our focus is elsewhere. Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. Third, and finally, God is always faithful to His covenant people, even when they're not. Israel would fail again, but in Christ we see the one who gave Himself for us sinners as an act of complete obedience to His Heavenly Father. So take some time this week and pray about your giving. And is it where God wants it to be? If you have to think long about it, maybe it's not where God wants to be. Maybe you've never really thought about it. Maybe you've never been taught tithing. It's a subject that I said a lot of churches and pastors shy away from, but it's part of the Scriptures. And remember, blessing follows obedience. In 1 John 5, 3, it says, Here's how we know that we love God. We keep His commands, and they're not burdensome. So whatever you give, give it cheerfully. Let us pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I said that God wants our heart. Can you say for sure that God has your heart? 
that you're His child, that you've given your life to Jesus. If you can say that, thank God for your salvation. But perhaps there's one or more today, you have to be honest and say, I've never made peace with God. I want to give my life to Jesus for salvation. I understand from the Word of God that I am lost, and Jesus came to save me. If that's your heart, you can pray a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I readily admit that I'm a sinner. And I'm thankful that you went to the cross and gave your life and shed your blood to cover my sin. I am sorry for my sin. And I'm asking you to forgive me, to cleanse me. And Jesus, I'm opening my life and inviting you in to be my Savior. And I want you to be the ruler of my life from now on. Thank you for saving me. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer today, just ask you to slip your hand. I'm not going to point you out. Yes, are there any others that say, I prayed? Yes, you may put your hands up. Father, thank you for those that have said yes to Jesus, and I pray that you give them the confidence that when they invite you to be their Savior, they're your child forever. They can never lose that salvation. Father, for those who are your children by faith in Jesus, Lord, may we, on a regular basis, evaluate our walk with you. May we invite your Spirit to show us our heart condition. And Lord, in this area of tithing and giving, May we be open to your Spirit's leading and your will for our lives. May we pray, Lord, what is it that you want me to give? And then may we give obediently and cheerfully and prayerfully and intentionally. Lord, take this body of believers and use us to further your kingdom, which brings you honor and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.